Okay. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back everyone as we're preparing. The Shabbat Parashat Shemot. We're starting a new Sefer. The Sefer Geula, the Book of Redemption, the Book of Exodus. And it's very important that when we learn through this Sefer, we learn through Sefer Shemot, we learn through this Parashiot that are dealing with Yitziat Mitzrayim, with the redemption and the um, leaving of Mitzrayim, is that we learn these Parashiot very carefully. The Rebbe of Kotsk, Zechat Tzadik Libracha, said that when you're learning these next few Parshas in the Torah that talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim, of the redemption from Egypt, a person should study it as if he's studying Gemara Bi'iyun, as if he's studying the Talmud in depth, the way one studies Halacha in depth. That's the way a person is supposed to study these next few parashiot in the Torah. Every parashiot should study in depth, but especially these next few, because they deal with how the Jews were in exile and how they came out of exile. And we know the Torah is a lesson for life. Now we have a community exile, we're all in. We're in a communal exile. We're not in Yerushalayim, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash, we don't have a Mashiach. So the blueprints of how to get out is right here in Sefer Shimon. Also, people have their own personal exodus, personal uh, exile, and they need their own personal exodus. They need their own personal Kiulah and Yeshua. And the, the uh, code, or the secrets, and the lessons of how to get out of the Galut, of getting out of the exile, can be found in this Sefer of the Torah, the Sefer Shemot. The number one lesson to take away as we go through Sefer Shemot is that of Bitahon. Is that of believing in what our Kaddish Baruch Hu tells us. Yosef HaTzadik tells the Jewish people, Hashem will redeem you, right? Hashem tells them, says, Yaakov, I'm going to take you out. And Yosef tells the Jewish people before he passes away, Hashem will save us. And with this emunah, with this bitahon, this is how the Jewish people left. Think, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu, the saver of the Jewish people. He's put into a casket. He's thrown into the Nile River. If an observer, someone was watching this, and doesn't know what history will bring in the future, what would he think is the chances of Moshe Rabbeinu, little baby Moses, in a basket in the river? What was the chances of Moshe Rabbeinu's survival? Almost zero, right? Statistically speaking, a person can say, a little baby in a run-down, broken basket in a Nile River flows, and what's not in there, crocodiles and whatnot, also manners are fish, and who knows? And yet Moshe Rabbeinu survives. Not only he survives, Miriam says, I know he's going to survive, and she goes and watches. And Hashem had everything set up that the Paro's daughter, Bitya, Bitya all of a sudden has Sarat, and she wants to go wash herself off in the mikvah, and she goes to the, to the Nile, and she sees the baby, and she picks up the baby, she brings the baby home, and she raises him, and he becomes Moshe Rabbeinu. The one that Paro is trying to kill... It gets raised in Paro's own palace. How does this all happen? The Jewish people knew. They have him not in Akadosh Baruch. Hashem says he's going to save us. They mean he's going to save us. You see, a lot of people have what's known as intellectual bitachon. They believe in things. But when push comes to shove, and they really have to really believe to get through it, they don't. I'll give you an emotional example. Here he brings that there was once a certain darshan, a speaker, and he came to speak about the trait of anger. How kaas, how anger is very bad for a person. And he said, no matter what happens in your life, no matter who's talking, no matter what, never get angry. It's the worst thing. And he brought stories and Midrashim, and Mashalim, and he brought everything. Beautiful speech. Tori's in the middle of his speech, one of his attendants went to get him a cup of coffee to help him. You know, he's speaking for a long time, and he's like, drink something. So they bring him a cup of coffee. And as he's bringing the coffee, he puts it on the stender, and it spills, and he goes on to the rabbis, the Darshan's new suit, his white shirt. 
And what did the darshan do? He starts to scream again, you fool! What's wrong with you? How can you put the coffee here? Everything you destroy, and it's not the first time that you did it. You're always making mistakes. I don't know why I have you. One second. He was just talking about how you're not allowed to get angry. Three seconds later, he himself is getting angry. How can this happen? Because sometimes you know something, but to put it into practice is a whole nother idea. Right? The Dubna Magid says there was once a Masha, he says there was once a rabbi that said there is a pasuk in the Torah that if you have a dog that's bothering you, it's menacing, it's too big, and you're scared of it, there's a pasuk in the Torah you can say. You can say, And you say that the dog goes away. He's teaching this to his students. And all of a sudden, the big dog comes. And what does the rabbi do? The first one to jump out of his seat and start running away. <laughs> so his students come to him and say, Rabbi, you told us if you read this basuk, you don't have to be scared of anything. And he says, boys, you're right. But uh, when the dog came, everything flew out of my mind. I didn't even know what the basuk was. And so I totally forgot about it. It's the same thing with Bitahon. People know Hashem exists. Hashem is here. Hashem is going to help with everything. Hashem is going to take care of everything. But when he's up against the wall, all of a sudden, everything he forgets. There was once a doctor came to check up on the Divrei Hayim of Tans. And he asked him, what's your job? And the rabbi said, I build bridges. He says, building bridges? You don't look like a, build, a bridge builder. He says, no, I do. I build a bridge from my brain to my heart. Why? Because a lot of times we have things up here in our mind, but to put it in our heart and actually act upon it, it's a whole different world. It's not easy to do that. Everyone believes in Hashem. But does everyone believe in Hashem to that extent that they're supposed to? Right, famous, famous story, the Alshech once was giving a drasha. He was giving a drasha. And he said, the person has a munah bitahon HaKadosh Baruch he's never going to have to work. He's never going to have to work. Hashem will pay for everything. Hashem will give him a little money. So one guy came home and he told his wife, listen, I went to the Rabbi Shi'ur and he said today, if you believe in Hashem, you don't have to work, so I'm not going to work anymore. And he was home. He didn't know what to do. He didn't have any money. So uh, he sold his donkey. Got a couple of dollars. He sold his donkey to an Arab. An Arab took the donkey. And he went the first day with the donkey. He went, you know, mining for gold or for whatever. And they found the cave. And the Arab found the cave. And he found the treasure inside. He took the treasure. He loaded it on the donkey. Then he went back inside the cave to see if there's any more treasure. And what happened? The cave collapsed. And the Arab got stuck inside. Now, probably died eventually. There's no air. The, the old stones fell on him. And what did the donkey do? He's standing outside with a box full of treasure. The donkey's hungry. He wants to get food. Where does he go? He goes back to the original owner. He goes back to the original owner. And the Jew opens the door. There's his donkey. No Arab in sight. And the donkey has a whole thing of treasure. So he, everyone's like, wow, he believed in Hashem. And Hashem gave him all the money. So other people try this. I'm not working. Hashem. And nothing happened. So they came back to the Alshech. And they said to the Alshech, how can this be? The al said, he really had bitahon. You guys who tried it afterwards, you know, you were waiting for the donkey to come with the treasure chest. You weren't believing that Hashem was going to help you. Yeah, you did, but not to that extent. That's what it means to take bitahon that's in the head and put it into the heart. And how does a person really know? How does a person really know that he has bitahon, the correct bitahon? From this week's parasha, we'll end up with this idea on bitahon. We'll move to our next lesson. We said, Paro's daughter, Bitya, Batya, Basya, whatever you want to call it, the name is Bitya, that's the way it's going down in Tanakh. So Bitya goes down to the Nile and she sees Moshe in the casket. What did your Rebbeim always told you? What was the famous Midrash? What happened to her hands? They stretched, right? And then she stretched far and she was able to pick up the basket. Let me ask you, if you see, your, your, let's say you were playing with a football, right? And your football fell into the Nile and it's 
far, far away. Are you going to stretch out your hands? Or are you going to know there's no way to get it? No way to get it. And you're just going to stop right there. Is that what Bitya did? No. Even though she knew it was so far, what did she do? She still stretched out her hands. Why? Because if you have Imunah Bitahun and Hashem, you just have to do what Hashem told you to do. You don't have to actually do more than that. Hashem said to try to save a life, you try to save a life. Vizehu. And Hashem will take care of everything else. That's when a person you know has real bitachon. When he tries to do what Hashem told him, even though he says, ah, it's too cold outside, ah, it's too hot outside, ah, it's this problem, it's that problem. He doesn't stop it. Hashem said to do it. He does it. Because Hashem told me to do it, then it's doable. And Hashem will help me to do it. So if we go through this parshiot of Yitziat Mitzayim, as we were in exile, and we come out of exile, and we go to Geulah, because Hashem will have a Geulah Shalima. Our job is to look at these parashiyot, learn the lessons, with the number one lesson being, Let's look at a few lessons in this week's parashah that put this example into practice. We're going to start off with Paro makes a decree. Paro says, we got to kill all the baby boys. Right? So his first way to do this, he calls the midwives, Shifra and Pua. And he tells them when you go, midwives are those who help the ladies give birth. He says, every time you go to give birth to the ladies, when they go there, you're helping them as the doctors. You're going to look. If it's a girl, you keep her alive. If it's a boy, you kill them. And no one knows because you're the midwife. You can just say the baby was born dead. Sometimes, Shalom, you should never hear of it. But sometimes a baby could be born, and not just a miscarriage. Miscarriage is before they're born, but sometimes it could be a stillborn, which means the baby is born dead. It comes through the whole pregnancy. Shalom, no one should ever hear about this. It's very, very tragic. And that's what Paolo said. Every time a baby boy is born, you kill the baby and tell him the baby was born dead. That's it. Now, what did Paro want to do with the alive babies? He's going to kill them, throw them in the water. What was going on during that time when this was happening? What were the Jews in Mitzrayim? What were they? What was their life? Their life, they were slaves. They were working in the fields, right? What did you all learn in Midrashim that says, if they didn't finish the amount of bricks they were supposed to do, what did they do? They used the babies as a brick. Now, we have Shefra and Pua, and they don't go listen to Paro. They keep the babies alive. Why? Shifra Pua, what type of life are you giving the babies? These baby boys are going to be thrown into the Nile, probably eaten by crocodiles. They are going to be stuffed into the walls of the pyramids, or if that's what they were building. I'm, I'm not so sure they were building pyramids. But whatever they were building there for them, they would stuff them into the walls. What type of quality life is to be born a slave? What type of life is that? Shifra Pua, Why? Are you keeping the baby boys alive? You know why Shifra and Pua is keeping them alive? Even more. The women know they're living in slavery. They're working hard. The husbands are working hard. Everyone's working hard. And what did the Midrashim say? The women would go out to the fields. They would help their husbands. They would talk nice to them. They would make themselves look pretty so that their husbands would want to be with them and have children. What? In Mitzrayim, when everything's going bad? You want to have children? They're going to be slaves. They're going to be put into the wall. Why? Why is Shifra Pua keeping the babies alive? Kill them now. They don't have a bad life. You know why it is? Because they had Emunah. And they had Bitachon HaKadosh Baruch They knew that every Neshama has value. Every life has value. And they knew that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a plan. And the Kalash Baruch Hu knows what he's doing. And we don't start making our own calculations. Is it worth to live? Is it not worth to live? No one is allowed to make that calculation. There was a big, big king we had. His name was Cheskiyahu HaMelech. Cheskiyahu HaMelech saw in Shemayim through Ruch HaKodesh that he's going to have a son, Menashe. Menashe was a very evil king for the first part of his life. He killed lots of people, especially rabbis and Tamil Chachamim, especially Levi'im. He would kill them. The, the, the blood in Jerusalem was flowing because of, he was such an evil king. And so, Chizkiyot didn't want to have children. He didn't want to get married, he didn't have children. 
And the Navi Shaya comes to him and tells him, You will die because you're not listening to Hashem. He says, Why am I not listening to Hashem? He says, Because you're not having children. He says, I'm not having children. You know why I'm not having children? Because I know my child's going to be bad. And the Navi tells him, That's not your business. Your business is to do what the Torah tells you, it's to have children. What happens afterwards? It's like Kadosh Baruch Hu's business. You know what happened afterwards? Menashe became a big tzaddik. Menashe then helped build Judaism. He helped bring Torah afterwards. He did a lot of bad things, but he was about tshuva. All of everyone's tshuva today is compared to Menashe's tshuva. If it wasn't for Menashe, there wouldn't be no tshuva like we have today. Not only that, Menashe had a grandchild. King Yoshio, you know what he did? He made the biggest tshuva movement that all Kaisal ever had. A grandchild of Menashe. It's not our job to make calculation. Our job is to value life, continue life, and spread life. That, that's what Shifra Pua did. That's also what Miriam did. Think about this. Everyone knows the Midrashim. What happened? Paro said, kill all the boys. So what did Amram do? Amram said, I'm separating my wife. This way, not going to have any children. Miriam comes and says, Abba, he, she says, Papa John, you are worse than Paro. I was, how am I worse than Paro? He says, Paro said, kill only the boys, but not the girls. And you not being married, not boys, not girls. And we know that even a Shema even lived, that if one Shema came out for one second, he already has a chilek in Olam Haba, but you're not even letting the Shemot come out. And she said, you don't know what the world will bring. And what happened? Amram listened to his daughter, got remarried to Yechavim, and what came? Moshe Rabbeinu. Imagine, Amram didn't get married, he didn't listen to his daughter. There'd be no Moshe. There would be no Gilala, there'd be no Exodus. That's it, you do your job. And leave the rest of Gadosh Baruch Hu. That is Imunah, that is Bitahon. That's what we're supposed to do. In the world... In the world, in the world, they have a lot of theories out there. Scientists come and say, the world is overpopulated. There's not enough food. Right? There was this guy in the early 19th century, the early 1900s. There was this guy, uh, Malthusian. A Malthusian. Right? Mr. Malthusian theory. He came up with an idea that there's less land to make food and there's too many people. The world can't survive, so everyone stop having children. Right? Baruch Hashem, we're in 2022, and I can tell you, you can go to most people's houses here in America, and they don't even know what to do with all the food they have. So much food! Okay, sometimes there's a shortage of milk, and sometimes there's a shortage of eggs, but that's not because there's no, there's no food out there. It's because of the supply chain demand and all that COVID stuff that came in and still dealing with. But food is always available to millions of people, to everyone who needs. Today, science and technology has found ways to make more food with less amount of land. Right? For the advances in farming, the advances in everything. But there's always people that come up with ideas. Can't be. Too much people, too much children, too much this. You gotta cut it all down. What? Our job is to do what the Torah says. The Torah says, I have children, you have children. Hashem will help. Hashem will do everything else you need. There was in Eretz Yisrael, in the state of Israel, there was a very, very, very hard economic times going on. Hard economy. People were losing jobs. There was no money. And the government was trying to come up with ways to help the economy. So one of the people, one of the ministers, in Menachem Begin's government, there was a minister by the name, I'll tell you his name. Hold on a second. Mr. Tamir. Okay? Mr. Tamir. Shmuel Tamir. He was not a religious guy. And he came up with an idea. He said, we should legalize abortion. Make it okay. In Eretz Yisrael, to make abortion legal. Why? Because people have too many children. They have too many mouths to feed. It's harder to do. So let's give everybody a, cho- a chance to get rid of their babies. And this way, people will have more money. Now, in the beginning of the Israeli government, they had more respect for their rabbis. And so they went to the Tzadik of Yerushalayim to Rabbi Ariel Levin. 
And he said to Ray Levin, listen, you got to agree with me. Sometimes it's too hard to have so many children. Let people have ways to not have children. One of them, legalizing abortion. Let's do it. And the Rav said to him, listen, I hear you. And I hear that people you're saying have, have problems. But I want to let you know something. Every Nishama is very important. And Hashem helps everybody. And Hashem helps everybody. But I find it interesting that you are coming to me with this question. You know, about 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, he says a young couple, both of them were students, came to me. And they said they're married and they already have a daughter. And they're on their way with a second child and they know it's going to be a boy. But they know they don't have enough money. And they're asking the rabbi if they can have permission to abort the child. And the rabbi said to them, I cannot give you that permission. First of all, Hashem knows what he's doing. Hashem is a partner in this baby. Hashem gave me the mitzvah to have more children. I cannot permit you to do something. And plus, every child, every person has their own mission. And everyone's life is very valuable. So, I, I recommended them to have the child. And they did. So this Shemuel Tamir says to him, No, and were you right? Did this child become something special? Did this child fulfill his mission? And what did Ari Levin say? Ari Levin said, Well, you have to ask that question to yourself. Because you are that child that was born. Because your parents came to me and wanted to abort you. So now tell me, are you doing your mission? This is a true story. Rabutai, we all come up with ideas, do it like this, do it like that, like this, like that. That's not what to do. Our job is to have one Yeah, you have to go get a job. Yeah, you have to go make money. Yeah, you have to do certain things. But at the end of the day, it also comes to my Kaddish world. You have life, you have to value life. You have to know how valuable life is. How many people... I've met on their deathbed who beg, oh, I wish I would have done life differently. Oh, I wish I would have had more children. Oh, I wish I would have done that. Now you have the chance. Now is the time to do it. Have it, Munamita Hon Hashem. Hashem said, do it. Do it. How it gets done, how it gets done is Hashem's, Hashem's job. Let's move on to our final lesson from this week's Parasha. <clears throat> so Paro needs to come up with a plan how to destroy the children, right? How to destroy the boys. So he has a council. He has a group of people. Advisors. Advisors. Who is his advisors? Everyone knows the famous Midrash. We had Yitro, Bilam, and we had Eo. Okay, so Bilam, we know Bilam hates us. Bilam wants to kill the Jews. He tells Farah, kill them. Throw them in the water. Hashem can't punish with water. He promised them to bring a marble. Fine. Then Yitro says, don't touch the Jews. Right? Leave them alone. Let them live. They're upset with him. Yitro has to run away for his life. He runs to Mitchell. Okay. Eo thinks to himself and says, sat quietly. He said, why am I getting involved? Yitro said, no. He, they're chasing him away. I don't think it's right. But you know what? I'm going to keep quiet. What happens to Eo in the end? What happens to Ol in the end? Okay. So Bilam, he gets killed. Right? Eventually he fights against the Jews. The Jews come and they kill. Bilam dead. Uh, Yitro, Yitro becomes his father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? And what happens to Eov? Eov, his skin is peeling off. He has so much pain. He lives a life of pain. So much, so much. Why is that the right punishment for Eov? He didn't say anything. He should say something. Okay, we're going to see why we have to say something. But very right. Okay, let's move on now to the idea how to build up to here. There's a Mishnah in Perkei Avot. The Mishnah in Perkei Avot says there are 48 things you have to do to be able to have Torah, to be able to acquire Torah. One of the things it says is to be nos'eb be'ol chavero, to participate in your fellow's burden. When someone else has a trouble, you have to feel their trouble with that. Why is that? So the Mepharshim explained, you know why? Because when Hashem gave the Torah, did He give it to one person? Did He give it to you only? 
He came to all Klai Yisrael and he said, here's a Torah for all of you. That means in order to get Torah, we all have to be together. You cannot get Torah if you're not together with somebody else. That's why one of the ways to acquire Torah is to be worried about your friend. To help him out. To do something for them. Next week's parasha, it starts listening the Shvatim and their children. It says Ruven. This is Shimon. But when it comes to Levi, it says these are the names of Levi's children. Right? You're a Levi. You know how important Levi's family is? Listen, I remember Levi's family was the only Sheba that wasn't enslaved. They weren't working as slaves. They didn't go to work to slaves. But you know what? They felt the pain of their of their brothers. Why? They had three children. Levi had three. And each child's name is named after the problems that were going on at the time. Gershon, Gerim, that they were aliens in the land. Kehat, that means their teeth were being shuttered. They were suffering. They were gritting their teeth in pain. Merari, their lives were bitter like Maror. Levi felt the pain of all of Klai Yisrael. It says on this week's parasha, Moshe grew up and he went out to sea. To see his brothers, how they were slaves. And you know what the Midrash says? The Moshe went and he helped them. He started, he was the prince of Egypt. He grew up in Pharaoh's palace. And as the prince, he put down his crown and he went and he was schlepping and he was acting as a slave. Why did Moshe do this? Moshe said, They're my brothers. I feel their pain. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to help them. You know what happened there over here once he did that? You know what the Midrashim say and the Farshim say? When Moshe Rabbeinu took off his royal garments of a prince and went and helped another Jew, Hashem said, you went to help another Jew? I will copy you, Moshe Rabbeinu, and I will now set up the time to free them. Meaning that when one person helps another, HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes and says, I will help them. Here I saw in the Torah suites, he brought down a story from Rabbi Eliyahu Kiddushim. He says, one day, I found out that a neighbor of mine, his, his heater broke. And the family was staying in sweaters and coats. And they were having a hard time to find someone to fix it. They didn't have the money to pay for it. So the rabbi said, you know what, I spoke with my wife and we said, we'll help. We'll find people, we'll help. And we'll, we'll call someone to fix it. We're trying to get a price. And we told the person, we're trying to help you. And we're going to try to figure something out. And all of a sudden, the next day, the guy calls me. We didn't even finalize anything. The guy calls me and tells me that the heating company who installed the heaters in his house called. They called him. And they said, we believe we made a mistake when we, when we set up the heaters. And we feel very bad for you. So we're coming to change everything else. And all of a sudden, his whole house, all the heaters were changed. Everything was working again. What? From where did they come? Where did it happen? And the other Kedoshim says, it's exactly it. Once we said that we want to help, Kedoshim said, another Jew wants to help another Jew? I'll come and I'll help them. That's what it is. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm going to send the Geula. I'm going to help another Jew. When one helps another Jew, Hashem looks down and says, you're helping another Jew? I will help another Jew. Now we can understand why Eov suffered. Why he was in pain and suffering in silence. Eov said, I don't know if I say something it's going to help. He says, it's not going to change anything. Because the truth is that you have to know that you don't really have to even do anything. But you have to want to do something. You have to say, I'm going to do. You want to help. Because once you put that into motion, then already Hashem starts to play as well. You need to start it off. That's why Eo was suffering by himself. And when he was suffering by himself, did he remain silent? He started to quetch. Oi, 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 oi. They say, why are you quetching? Does it help you when you're quetching when you're in pain? When you're in pain, then you go, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ah. Does it help? But you're doing it. The same thing. Even if you think what you're saying is not going to help, you say it. Because once you say it, there's already a Kadosh Baruch Hu sets things in motion. When you see an ambulance, I hear Rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Tawil, 
He says he was once in Eretz Yisrael. He was in Yerushalayim. He was there talking with a gadol. And an ambulance passed by. What did the gadol do? He stopped talking to him and he started to say, Shema Ma'alot. Why? He says, the guy's in trouble. The least I can do is say Sem Tihilim. And once we start saying Tihilim, what happens? HaKadosh Baruch Hu jumps in and Hashem takes over and Hashem helps. Our job is to feel the pain of somebody else. Our job is to feel what someone else is going through. He saw their burden. He was there. He came. He helped out. Now what it means, and this ideal will end, what does it mean to help someone out? Ahava Hesed. Someone needs help. You see it. What does it mean? It means there's two types of hasid. There's one hasid that you do to do. I want to do hasid. So you do it very coldly. Just very mechanically. But then there's another hasid. Ahavad hasid. You do hasid out of love. I love Hashem. I love a fellow Jew. I really want to help them. And you do it to that extent. That is the extent of what we're talking about. Ahavad hasid. To look out for someone. Do something what they need. A man once came to meet with Rav Shach, and you can see the Rav Shach didn't eat anything yet. The man said, "Remy, I'll wait for you." And Rav Shach said, "My dear friend, talk to me because I'm not eating now anyway. It's eight fifteen, and I never eat between eight and eight thirty. You know why? Because every day I see Jewish children going to public school, and it hurts me. And so I fast." From the pain, I have to do something, and what I do is I fast and I dive into Hakadosh Baruch Hu that these Jews would go to Yeshiva, they would learn what it means to say Kriyat Shema, what it means to say thank you to Hakadosh Baruch Hu to learn His Holy Torah. Rabbi that's what's incumbent upon us. What's incumbent upon us is to look for another Jew to see how can I help them. If you can't help them, you should feel bad that you can't help them, and hopefully that would set stuff in motion. And so Rabbi Tai. To go through the three lessons that we came out of this week's parasha. One lesson for all Sefer Shamot is that it's all based on Emunah. That's why it says, because of the righteous women, because they had more Emunah than the men. They went to have children, they kept their children. Even though they knew the quality of life and the troubles that were there. Midian made sure Moshe Rabbeinu was born. Otherwise, it would be nothing. The men were backing out. I don't want to have any more children. It's too trouble, too much problems. And then Emunah, Shem said he's going to redeem. It's going to redeem us. Our second lesson was, don't make hejbanot. Don't make all sorts of calculations. Your job is to do your job. Your job is to do what you have to do. And the Kaddish Baruch Hu will help with the rest. And the third lesson was, when we see someone in trouble, we go and we help them. Because when we go and we help them, the Kaddish Baruch Hu says, what? A Jew is helping a Jew? I'm going to go and help them as well. May we be zochet to the Gula Shalima. May we be zochet to help one another. May we be zochet to know Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us a job and we fulfill our mission without questions and only with belief that we're doing it correct. Be'ezat Hashem, we should all be zochet to these great things. We should be zochet to a Shabbat Shalom. Tadah Rabbah Lachon.